Hey guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is called Seven Souls by Inside Up Games. Seven Souls is a one to six player board game that takes roughly 30 to 45 minutes to play and is for ages 13 and up. And in the game Seven Souls, you are playing as one of the different mythos monsters from the HP Lovecraft mythos. In this game, you're going to be getting a deck of corruption cards. You will be receiving a certain number of characters that are going to help you along the way to achieve your goal, which are your little cultists. And you're also going to be choosing one of your objectives card, which is actually also one of the great old ones that you are using to sway the world into your favor. Um, and you're basically going Going to be playing down these specific cultists that you have into different locations or regions on the board. And you'll be placing them and trying to gather uh, investigators to join your side or corrupting the people inside these locations as well as obtaining power, souls, and even more corruption. When one of the tracks uh, loses two of their spaces, that will trigger the end of the game, and whoever has the most points via souls is the winner. We'll take a look at the game after I show you how to set the game up, and then of course tell you how to play, and then finally I'll give you my review. The first thing you're going to ask yourself when playing Seven Souls is how many players are playing because that will depend on how you set the game up. And for this example, we will do a three player game. Basically what's going to happen is you're going to take the game board and place it down in the center of the table. Then you're going to look at the game board. You'll notice that there are nine spaces on the bottom left through right hand side and these are going to be circular spaces and you're going to have your corruption which will be these cards here. You're going to have souls which are these yellow tokens and then you're going to have power which are the blue ones. You look at the top number of each of the circles and that will determine the one to three player gameplay and how many of those specific items go there. And and the bottom number is for four to six. So if I look at this top circle, it says 15 for the top and 20 for the bottom. I'm playing three players, one to three players at the top. Then I'm gonna put 15 of these corruption cards down on this space. And you'll do the same for your power, your souls, power, corruption, soul, um, no, sorry, souls, corruption, power, power, souls and corruption and you'll just go ahead and place these guys down then I suggest you go from top to bottom you'll place three investigators up at the very very top from the main deck that you shuffled if however you are not playing with um, three players and if you were playing with just two players you'll take out all the investigators that have if you look at the top right hand side of their cards they have two red cards in the middle you will remove those and just use the ones that have a red card in the bottom or the top of the stack but if you're playing with all three or any more players and you can just simply add all these cards together shuffle them and just deal out three to the top section uh, the top left hand side of the game board is going to be the horror cards just place all the horror cards right up there then you'll come to the bottom left and right hand side of the game board. These are going to be your altars. Uh, you're going to place four of them based on the number of players playing the game. If you're playing with all six, obviously all four. But if you're just playing the uh, three player variant, you'll add the two to six card and you'll add the one to six card and you'll remove the five to six and four to six. You won't play with these. Then the last thing is you're going to be placing down your blessings. Uh, there are three that you can add to the bottom of the game board and they are having, gonna have requirements on them. Just place them down. It doesn't matter the number of players that are playing the game. Now it comes to the players. What you're going to be doing in the game is giving every single player one power. You're also gonna give every single player an objective card um, and or two objective cards and you could choose between one of them at the start for each player that is playing. Each player is also going to receive a deck of their cultists. They should have a total of seven of them, which they're going to have as their hand. And finally, they're going to have a corruption deck. It's going to start the game with four of these horror cards and one of these cards here. This is a corruption card that's actually pretty useful. It's called Focused. Focused has one eyeball and then Determined has two. And when you take all five of these cards, you'll shuffle them together and place them down in front of you and that will be your specific deck. Each other investigator, or I should say cultist leader, <laughs> great old one, is going to be having the same cards. The only difference is that each player is gonna have a unique different color for their, their cultist baddies. And otherwise it will be the same. Set aside all of the power and souls that are not in the game, as well as every single player deck that is not being used, all the extra objective cards, as well as the extra blessings, and of course the extra corruption cards. You will not need these in the game. 
After that, you pretty much shut the whole game up, and now we can go through how to play. So when playing this game, it is a simultaneous game. You go from steps one all the way to seven, and you're going to complete them at the same time, one at a time in order. Now, when you're playing the first round, you're not gonna be doing the first thing, which is going to be to recall, which means that any of the investigators that you didn't play this round, but the previous round, uh, you're going to be basically taking back. So the previous, previous round. So if last round I had played these guys, and the previous round I played these, these will come back to my hand. And then next round, these will come back to my hand. And so on and so forth. Uh, but the second portion is the threat assignment. You will take one of the top cards from the deck here, you'll place it on the bottom of the investigator deck, these are the bad guys, or the good guys, depending on how you look at things. And then you'll have an assigned uh, character or investigator that will be attacking us, which kind of mixes it up each round so that we don't know exactly who's going to be hitting us. The next thing that's going to happen is we are going to be doing a soul selection. We'll be taking our characters, our cultists, and placing them down in each of the three locations. And the locations are these houses here. So there'll be one on the left, one on the top middle, and one on the top right. And each player will actually be doing this. And I'm just gonna do two, just as a quick example here. But yeah, you'll be placing them, and you'll be choosing them. And it actually does matter who places when, because the first player is going to get a benefit. After the soul selection, each player, and I mean every player, if you're playing with six players, there'll be six cards in each of these regions here, uh, plays a card in each of the regions, and you move on to the character activation. One location at a time, you will be flipping over characters for all the players, and then you will be assigning um, them based on the order they were played and based on the number. Uh, the characters with the lower number will be going first, and the characters with the higher number will be going last. If you look at a character card, it will tell you the number of the character on the top left-hand corner, and will tell you the actions that character can take in the section on the left-hand side. If a character has a full section with bubbles in it, little like blue, yellow, and purple, you'll be doing all of those actions. If there are multiple sections with multiple bubbles, you're going to uh, select one of the sections. So if you have uh, one section with two bubbles in it and one section with one bubble, you can either do these two or this one. And that's all you can do. You'll choose one of those two. So some of them will give you more variation, but less actions. And some of them will give you more actions and less variation or a ton of variation, all the actions, but you won't get to take multiples of one, et cetera, et cetera. And they all have different numbers on them. And if there's a tie, there's gonna be a unique little thing that will happen. You'll actually be taking cards from this deck here and uh, you'll, you'll reveal one before deciding to power up or not which you'll be using these little tokens here. I'll explain most of this in my review portion, but yeah, you're gonna be flipping over cards from this deck here of non-keepable cards, they'll go away, to determine who actually gets to take the action and who doesn't. So if there's ties, you have to be careful because that might mean somebody's going to be left out. But otherwise, if there's no tie, you're just gonna go from the bottom portion all the way to the top portion of the player's numbers and let them perform the actions. And let's go through actually all the actions and I'll grab one that has all of them. Uh, this investigator is the one investigator. He actually has all of the different actions. Action one is you can take one power from the row of the location that you are in. You'll just put, grab this and place it down. Uh, the next action is going to be a yellow circle, which will allow you to take a power from the location that you are in, this little uh, column here. And on the bottom, you can look and see, this is how many points you're gonna get at the end of the game if you keep this power. The next thing is corruption. You will actually take a corruption card. They're always going to be uh, ones or twos, focused or determined. So when you're shuffling these guys and placing them down here, make sure you don't forget that all the horrors start over here. They don't go in these. These are good cards. Those are bad ones. Then the next thing that you're going to do, oh, okay, I should just put this in my deck, and you would shuffle it as well, don't forget that. Uh, then the next action that you can do is a horror. Now this is actually not for you, this is for your opponent. You will take one of these horror cards and you'll give it to your opponent and they will shuffle that into their deck. And finally the last thing is the investigator attack. You can choose if you'd like to attack an investigator. So how that works is you will check the investigator, and let's go over the investigator cards. The top right is how many victory, or top left is how many victory points you'll get. The top right is which investigator they're attacking if this is the chosen investigator to fight. The bottom left is when they attack, this is how much power that they have and what they want to steal from you. So you'll go through this corruption deck thing where you'll be uh, flipping over a card, same thing, it's kind of a tie, but if you hit that power, and without um, going under, you can stop them from taking these resources from you. Otherwise, for each power you're missing, they are going to take these resources from you and place them on this card. Over here, though, is going to be the four and five, or it could be five and four, or five and five, different numbers here. The top card 
is how many power you need to defeat the investigator, and the bottom is how many cards you have to do it. So when you fight an investigator, you'll actually be revealing cards from your corruption deck. And before you reveal each card, you can choose to power it up. To power up a card, you'll have to have a blue power. You can use up to two per card. And when you flip, and if you chose the power, that could give you, oh, two power. And all you'll need to do is so I'm going to flip another and I'll do another power. And if you have this one here, and hopefully if you had another, that'd be successful. If not, maybe it's a horror card. You're only going to get the one. <laughs> So that's basically how this will work. You'll go through that and if you're successful, you actually will take this investigator here and claim it. It'll basically be set aside and you'll score victory points for it. If you don't, you'll just lose these cards. Every time you use this deck, the cards are going to be lost. So make sure that you are careful with how you use them. And whenever you fight another investigator and you win because of a tie situation up here, you'll actually give them any of the good cards that you might have had and they'll put into their deck. Any cards will be kind of transferred from one player to another to the loser. And you'll simply go from that location to the next location and uh, to the next location. And you'll be doing all the actions that you possibly can. Um, additionally, to for each location that you go through, at the end of each of those players' turns, when they take their cards' actions, they can choose to either A, take one of these altars, which is spend the appropriate currency on the bottom right-hand side of the card and take one of these, and you only get one of them. Or so you can actually have more, because these, these are the ones you spend with. And you also have the option to take one of these blessings. Now you can only take one of these blessings in the game. And if you choose not to take one at one point, you can't take that one. You have to go for a different one. And they have different costs as well, but they don't, they're not spent. Once you basically gain, once you uh, have the cost, you just take this and keep it and you don't spend the cost. So this one requires you to have 10 power. And so if you have 10 power, you get this card, if that makes sense. Whereas this one requires you to spend four power. And like I said, you'll go through all these different locations, and then you're going to go to the investigator attack. The investigator attack will be based on the top card of this deck here. It is a key. It will be fighting against, uh, you'll be fighting against these guys here. This guy says it wants to fight the player with uh, the highest number, and so you will check and see. Oh look, each player played a two, thusly it's a tie. He'll be fighting both players. If one player played a six and another player played a one, the player who had a six would be attacked. After the investigator is done attacking, then you go ahead and you will check to see, does the game end? And the game is going to end when, in the columns, one, uh, uh, when two of the three areas in a column have been completely removed of resources. And that will trigger the end game, which is basically going to uh, have you all look at your victory points. You'll look at your souls. The back of your souls will decide how many points you have there. For each investigator that you have, you'll score victory points as well from the top left-hand corner. Your altars are going to score you victory points in the top left hand as well, and the idols here. The rest of the cards will not matter. It won't matter what your corruption deck looks like, it won't matter what characters you have, and that's basically the idea of the game. Whoever has the most victory points when that happens wins. Otherwise, you simply rinse and repeat. You're going to be once again flipping over one of these cards to change whoever the fighter is, and also, don't forget, whenever uh, you defeat an investigator, you'll just take the top card of the deck and place it there, which can actually change who is going to be being, uh, who's going to be targeting. And, and also, don't forget that the symbol up here represents one of these locations here, and it's a little hard to see, but there's a book, a key, and a cross. But otherwise, that's pretty much the idea of the game. I didn't get into fighting exactly so much with this investigator deck, but I'm going to review most of this stuff anyway. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's how you play the game Seven Souls. All right, let's talk about what I think about it. Seven Souls is basically a mini deck builder mixed in with an action management slash area control game. Uh, it's lightly area control in the fact that whoever has the... Um, uh, lowest card in the area will go first, and whoever places their card first will get to decide, like, uh, on ties has, like, a better advantage to it. Um, and as far as action management, you'll be ter determining what actions that you have in your hand that you can utilize, because you're not going to always have all your actions after the first round, and where you want to place them. And then, of course, uh, what cards you get, what, what, what cards you get from this deck here, whether it be from your opponent giving you horror cards, or whether it be from these nice stacks here of corruption that are going to give you those determined and focus cards, which are what you want. That's what gives you corruption, and that's what helps you defeat investigators. Drawing one of these horror cards 
garbage. You don't want it for investigators. If you end up drawing four cards to fight the investigator that has four cards uh, that are required for him, and this would be zero power. However, drawing these cards here, that's two eyeballs, that would be two. Maybe they need four power to defeat them. That would be only two more that you've had, you'd have to get in order to win. And the fact that you can power up these cards as well before you flip them by using the power that you've gained from actions is super, super useful. So you're gonna be kind of doing a mini deck builder of sorts. You're also gathering tokens. One is just simply gathering victory points that can range between zero and I believe three victory points, at least two on these little souls here. And then power, which is a way to allow you to gain strong, high amounts of victory points, whether it comes from being able to uh, buy these altars here that score victory points for you. At a cost though, so for instance, if I got this altar here, it'll give you three victory points in the, the game. It'll cost you four power, but also what's also kind of nasty about this guy is, which I didn't explain, when you gather this, you'll choose the investigator in which the, the round, you know, they have three rounds or three different actions uh, from each of these cards here in the phase. So let's say I, we were on the second location and this um, location gave me the power I needed to buy this. I could then use the investigator from that location and put it here on this card and put it face down and remove for the rest of the game, but I will score these points. Or I can use the cards in my hand and take one of them and get rid of one of these guys here. So the more of these altars you get, the more characters you have to sacrifice in order to achieve them. And they're also going to be giving you those victory points at the end of the game. And there's also a cost to them. So maybe getting too many altars is not a good idea. Now, one or two is not super bad. And in fact, getting one of them is going to let you get a blessing for free, provided you're the first person to do it. So it is kind of worth it. Blessings are always good. You only get one of them though. And you have to kind of determine uh, which one you want to go for. Obviously the ones with power are, more, are, are better than the ones for the altar, which are easier to get, but have a higher cost. So you're constantly debating when you want to choose to do these things. And some of them you have the option to do when you want others. It's when you want to do it, if you can do it, and if you don't, you move on to a new one. And yeah, you'll just go on from each of these locations and do your actions. All the cards have unique, specific types of action fields, whether it be just getting three of the corruption cards from the stack in your area, or maybe you can choose between two different sets, whether it be two power, or you can get one soul and give your opponent one corruption card for their corruption deck, and so on and so forth. Each player has the same unique deck, which is nice as well. So it feels fair and balanced, and there is a good chance that you're going to tie with at least somebody in the game. And even when you're playing two players, you're likely to tie as well, at least once every other round, if not more than that. In fact, we have tied multiple times in a single round. Uh, the investigators and how they fight is pretty fun as well, as well as the fact that when they hit you, so you kind of have this two layered aspect to investigators. It's at the end of the round, they fight one person or multiple people, people based on what they're trying to do. Um, and each player is going to be flipping cards from their little corruption deck and hopefully going to be able to stop or stave the investigator from stealing the cards that they want. Sometimes it's better to be hit by, by the investigators than lose certain tokens though. And so you have to make up your mind, but okay, I have to flip over a card. I can assign power to that card. If I get lucky, I prevent the attack. If not, however much power I did not spend slash power I gain from these corruption cards, I'm going to lose what they want. And whatever they get, whenever they get what they want, they're going to go on these cards here, which when they get defeated, you'll actually be taking these cards here when you defeat them and all of the resources on them as well will go to you. Horror cards never go to them. They simply go back to the deck here. Uh, and then the other side of it is actually fighting them specifically. And if you can beat them based on their requirements, you'll take them and you'll just gain them as points. And these guys are worth a lot. So defeating these guys is probably the best way to go throughout the game. And it has a lot of moving parts. It's a very simple game in nature. There's seven little steps and each step that you go through is pretty straightforward. And after you've gone through the first round or so, you'll understand how it works. Um, the rules. While we're in the rules, there's a lot of subtext. I would suggest that you go through the rule book and make sure that you don't miss any of the little squared boxes or purple boxes. Make sure that you read them all in each of the different portions of it. If you do miss doing one of those things, you'll miss uh, interpreting some of the rules in the game. Copy A is a little weird to it. It's probably my least favorite part about the game is just going through that and trying to piece together everything. It, uh, it wasn't super complicated. There are some things that we missed even in our live playthrough that were pretty straightforward and we should have not missed them, but on the fly, learning it for the first time, it's going to happen. However, I would just suggest to you strongly to make sure that when you go through the booklet, if you're not just watching a review video that explains the, the game or how to play video, then you should do that specifically. 
Um, but that, other than that, it's a really great game. The artwork is solid. I love the different characters that you're going to be utilizing. They're kind of like your evil cultists being sent out to steal souls. Investigators go to those locations and try and stop you from doing so. You're all being controlled by a great old one that you'll get to choose at the beginning of the game. Those two different green cards you'll get and you'll select one of them, which, re which represents kind of an old one from HP Lovecraft. That has a requirement that you have to meet by the end of the game. And if you do, you also score victory points, which is pretty solid. Uh, the fact that you're not always going to get back all your cards and based on how you play and your opponent's play will determine whether or not you can tie or win in certain areas or avoid being attacked, which is also nice. And you can kind of interpret the likelihood of you surviving or staving off being attacked. Then, of course, you have the corruption deck that you can kind of wield to utilize against the specific investigators that can be either your downfall or to your benefit based on what people are doing to you in the game. And there's a light player interaction, which is nice as well. People can give you horror cards. People can take maybe the last power that you want on a space. Um, there's, there's just, it's not super heavy on that, which is why I like for these type of games, but it does have that. It feels more than I'm just playing like a solitaire game when I'm playing with multiple players in this. In fact, with multiple players comes a lot of interaction with these different location spaces spaces. The game board as well is beautiful. I love the highlights to the board. I love the style. I like how the bottom shows like the evil mythos monster popping out from underneath the ground and then you have this kind of quaint tired foggy town above. This game's art kind of reminds me of the HP Lovecraft book uh, Color of The Color of Space. Uh, even with the different type of Cthulhu, Cthulian monsters that you'll see, there's a few that represent that in my opinion. I don't know what the artist was going for, but the idea of like being afraid of like not understanding or interpreting lights and colors and sounds, and we only have so much to our imagination. And it kind of brings that out in this game. The theme shines through it beautifully, and it does a really, really great job. I wasn't sure that I was going to like this one at first. It seemed a little bit overly complicated for a light card game. And then as I started to get into it, I realized it's, it's not that light. It's actually more of a mid-tier medium game. It's got some thickness to it. It's got some chunkiness. It's got some social interaction. It's got a little bit of all that stuff. And uh, it really worked for me. There's a lot of cool little concepts, a lot of mechanics that kind of work and entwine together, and it has a very simplistic feel. And even when the game ends, it's pretty straightforward. You know kind of when it's gonna happen, and you can kind of prepare for it. It never felt like it overstayed its welcome, and it also never felt like I didn't play enough. Sometimes that can be good. In this case, I actually liked it knowing, okay, I can make this game go a little longer to try and get my next turnover, or maybe it's time to end it because I feel like I have the most points, but in a round or two, maybe I won't. And because of all that, it just worked really, really well for me. It was a lot of fun, and there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. The Seven Souls game by Inside Games is a solid recommendation for me. I'm keeping this game, for sure, not just because of the Cthulian Lovecraftian mythos, but also because it's a great game. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Seven Souls by Inside Up Games. If you're interested in picking it up, there will be a link down below in the description where you can go ahead and check out this game. Highly recommended. It is fun. You can also go ahead and check out our website unfilteredgamer.com. We have blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. We're currently giving away a game of Mind Bog Beyond the Expansion Evolution, which is a standalone game. And you can go ahead and just click the button on the site and get that game, hopefully, if you're lucky. Um, you can also check out our live streams every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. And on Wednesdays, we do whatnot. So Sunday is pretty much everywhere. You can find us on, on our, web, our website, YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and then whatnot is at 6.30 on Wednesdays. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. Make sure if we've earned your subscription, if you've watched more than one of our videos before, or if I've seen you on Dead by Daylight, that was kind of interesting. I've seen a few people now on when I've been playing my video games. People notice me. This is a shocking, but it's also very flattering as well. Then please do consider subscribing. All right, guys, that's all I got for this time. And as always, I look forward to seeing you guys next time.